Welcome to day two of this inaugural symposium. I am delighted about the Institute for Information Literacy at Purdue uh, to Clarence and the team for making this happen. Yesterday was really quite compelling. I'm anticipating today will be too as well, and I'm only going to talk really quickly because I know we need to jump in. But again, thank you. Uh, a lot of planning, a lot of time, and um, this experience the last two days is really thanks to uh, some Purdue alums who helped us with funding for the pilot year. And I'm very grateful, and I know that Clarence is as well. So thank you for being here. Um, we're a smaller group in person, but lots of people online. And yesterday, we had a whole lot of registrants, which makes me think that this isn't just a pilot. We're going to do it again next year. So again, thank you very much. And Clarence, are you going to introduce, or was I supposed to do that? Great. <laughs> So uh, our first talk is um, going to be from uh, Anish uh, Vanek and uh, Dwayne um, Gen uh, I'm going to say it wrong. Gengali. Yeah. Um, and uh, Anish and Dwayne are both professors in the Honors College. Uh, and they're actually presenting, uh, well, with their uh, research colleague who won't be here today, but he, he's worked on the project, Rolf Peterson from Susquehanna. Um, university. I was joking earlier that I could say that because I'm from Pennsylvania. <laughs> um, and while they do a lot of different kinds of research, uh, a project that they're working on together is that they are uh, studying portrayals of Black Lives Matter cartoons uh, from a sort of cultural phenomena, right? Uh, and that's what they're going to talk about today. So with that, I'll turn it over to Anish and Duane. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Clarence. Uh, thank you uh, to the organizers for inviting us uh, to join in this important conversation uh, about the role of information and disinformation in democracy. Um, we thought we'd start, though, with an ungrateful question. Uh, what one might wonder is a paper on editorial cartoons doing uh, in such a symposium. After all, editorial cartoons are notable precisely because they don't work on the register of factual truth. It would be absurd to haul up recently retired Washington Post cartoonist Tom Tolles for the fact that no statue had the words overt racism carved into them. And where in the world is this pedestal of economic inequality? And who's asking for the removal of these pedestals? Indeed, editorial cartoons are unique and important pieces of visual communication precisely because they distort reality to arrive at a different register of truth. We'd suggest that this deeper register of truth, uh, the frameworks within which particular instances of information and misinformation play out, for instance, about the provenance of statues in this instance, uh, is crucially important, however, for any discussion of disinformation. Uh, in this paper, we'll be offering some reflections on why it is important to always reflect on the overarching setting which makes certain questions prominent and therefore deserving of distortion or correction, while others are avoided. So what is the importance of that broader, let's call it, landscape of information? A few reasons uh, can be offered for paying attention to this. Um, first, many of the same reasons that drive efforts to distort information also operate through keeping an issue, an idea, a thought beyond the conversation altogether. In the issue that we take up, uh, of racism, for instance, uh, distorting, misrepresenting problems, framing images of black folks in certain ways, and maintaining silences about, or indeed turning up the volumes about certain kinds of stereotypes have all been part of this shared arsenal of weapons through which the culture of white supremacy has been sustained. Second, uh, for the folks combating these structures, silences as well as active disinformation both have to be addressed. Uh, you cannot simply restrain yourself to intervening on one terrain, leaving the other. Uh, we can see then that a simple technical fix, better fact checking, source analysis, et cetera, to either the problem of silence or dismiss information are inadequate as a response. An understanding of the structure of power and politics must also be part of any framework that's interested in addressing mis or disinformation. The final point uh, in this prelude is that on questions of power, the significance of counter-hegemonic movements cannot be underestimated. Movements of and in support of oppressed sections of society 
advocate for ideas of greater equality in the public sphere. And this entails, as we mentioned before, both making visible existing circumstances and applying efforts to counter distortions, disinformation. In moments of strength, movements succeed in making their points of view salient and communicated with clarity. Uh, they are trying to alter the landscape itself and not merely this or that part of it. Okay, uh, there is of course considerable scholarship. Most folks here will be familiar with it about the fact that social struggles unfold in part as a symbolic contest. Uh, scholars employ the idea of frames and framing contest to talk about this. Uh, we're using a fairly conventional definition of framing. I won't repeat it. You've probably heard it many times from Robert Entman. Um, that that uh, amount to the fact that frames define problems, offer causal explanations, moral adjudications, and solutions, or some combination of these, uh, to uh, viewers. So the ability of movements to affect framing in the broader culture has everything to do with this tussle of power, this framing contest. Uh, to sketch a broad theory, again, of how social movements deploy frames, movements try to increase, increase what communication scholars call resonance and magnitude of the frames that they offer. One of the hoped for outcomes of this increased resonance and magnitude is a raised salience of movement frames and internalization of the frames among citizens. Uh, that increased salience, it is further hoped, might increase support for the movement and its goals. Antagonists of social movements do the same in the opposite direction. Like that, that is the framing contest uh, to think about it. Our researchers tracked the first portion of this framing contest, uh, carried out over the issue of racism in American life that has unfolded across successive ways of BLM, Black Lives Matter. Uh, we do so also in a particular medium, uh, the political cartoon. We're happy to take up questions about why political cartoon might be an interesting place to track this in the Q&A. We won't talk about it just now. Uh, but over the next few slides, we're going to present some of our findings about the broad pattern of how the culture of editorial cartoons was changed by mass mobilizations uh, in this period. Um, this will include an examination of the culture more generally, uh, as well as the frames that are employed by right-wing cartoonists more specifically, and we'll try and kind of correlate them. And we'll conclude by trying to tease out some implications we think this might have uh, about the necessity of thinking about power and justice when it comes to dis or misinformation. Sure. I get to push the mic up. <laughs> All right, so, uh, so what we want to start with is to think about the timeline of uh, the BLM movement, and this is a bit smaller than we anticipated. But uh, we want to think about it in three waves or, or two waves. Uh, so critically between the, the, the period of uh, 2012 to 2020. And so what we see here is like a, a leveling out of, uh, not leveling out, but more of what the mobilizations that occurs around uh, a period of um, Black Lives Matter. So for us, we think about it in a pre-BLM period. So that's before the, the, the killing of Trayvon Martin then we get into a BLM period and so on. So the cycle of movements here for us is one where it comes together under this term called Black Lives Matter, which doesn't come into our existence in any meaningful way in the mainstream, I imagine, until after the acquittal of, of George Zimmerman. So if we go back, Trayvon Martin, is a, he was 17 years old. He, he's killed in, in Florida holding a bag of Skittles. And, Zimmerman does the job and he gets off. And you know, shortly after that period or in, within that period, uh, three women, uh, Alisa Garcia, Patrice Collars, and Opal Tomity, they coined this phrase, Black Lives Matter. But it doesn't come up in, in the mainstream until we get around to the deaths or the killing of um, George, uh, of Eric Garner and, and what's the other guy's name? Michael Brown, sorry. Right, and so it starts to come in, into that period. So, so the media attention grows much more after that, and since fall 2014, what we've, we've witnessed is a various series of flashpoints in the country where you see protests happening, and uh, you know, reasonable amount of places in major cities. We saw that in, maybe in period between 14 and 16 happening on university campuses, so some of that happened on our, our campus here. And uh, you know, in sporting events, so we saw 
you know, the NBA protests, we, you know, we get the, the moment Colin Kaepernick starts to kneel. And then, you know, there, there's a wave that kind of ends in some ways, and we, it picks back up most prominently, uh, you know, by 2020. So that's a period in which George Floyd is killed. It's also the moment we have uh, COVID. It's now an era of, of Trump as well. And so for this study in particular, what we, we, we did was to collect over 2,000 uh, political cartoons, you might want to switch up, yeah, uh, over the, the, the period from uh, 31 cartoonists uh, from the period of January 2012 all the way up to December 2020. And these cartoonists we selected for different, based on different reasons. So uh, what we initially did was to collect what we call our mainstream cartoonists. And so those are people who would have won the major prizes in, in the discipline of cartooning. So that's the Pulitzer and the Herb Block. Uh, that's the biggest prize you can get. And so we, they would have to have won that, what, 10 years prior to 2014. And what's problematic about that is that sample is, is largely a liberal sample. Well, maybe that's not fully problematic, but uh, it excludes a lot of right-wing cartoonists, and it certainly has zero black cartoonists in, that, in the mix initially. So we had to then make sure that we complemented the sample by including uh, five black cartoonists and four conservative cartoonists. And we could talk about the selection process for what means uh, mainstream, uh, in the mainstream, we do have uh, right-wing cartoonists as well. And so we then went on to, to spend some time thinking about the codes and, and framing. You can go back real quickly. So these are, I think this is Steve Sack, and he's, this is after Minnesota, and I guess he's a little bit critical of Trump here. Uh, that's Darren Bell, one of our black cartoonists, and it's all about Trump, and it's hard to see, but there's a puppy dog little uh, and low, medium, high, and, and so on. And then this is Lisa Benson, who is a, uh, a right-wing cartoonist who, or conservative cartoonist who is basically talking about uh, the BLM movement and the protests and... What did I just say? The kids are acting up again. Just FYI, people online cannot hear you. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I apologize. Sorry to the crowd. Yeah. Okay, so these are some, like a snapshot of some of the cartoons. Right, so we, we, we collected these over time. And so this is a, a graph that, you know, it's a simple frequency graph uh, of our cartoonists in the mainstream sample. Uh, and the kinds of cartoons, so this is everything about racism, uh, and we'll get to the different types of things about racism, or at least touch briefly on some of them, over the entire period of our, our, our data set. So you can see, you know, what's interesting about this graph is the way in which it illustrates that at least from our perspective, that racism itself or actions of that cannot really get into, into the space until there are some level of protest behind it. I think you got click. Yeah, so we, what we try to do is to break down the, the various timelines here. I don't know if this is particularly clear, but you can see the Zimmer von verdict assisting in the spikes. I can't see myself. <laughs> yeah, Eric Garner and so on. So, that's the, the, the biggest thing for us is to see how whenever there is some level of mobilization that we can connect to, we start to see the spikes, right? Yeah, okay, I think that's useful. And so I think one can see that maybe around 2016, uh, the issue of racism kind of goes on the decline. I don't, know. I don't know if you want to point it out. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. <laughs> I probably should walk over there, but then the folks online won't be able to hear me. All right, and uh, so, and then, but what's resonating also is like most of the spikes in the 27 period for us is, it's just, you know, conventional stuff that connects with the political landscape. You know, we kind of think about this maybe as associating with Trump, uh, and uh, maybe some of the things that come around when Justice Sumet created this fake uh, attack uh, so he was a fake uh, allegation that he was a, a victim of racism. Uh, the, Sh the Charlottesville uh, far right ri r rally is the only major strike that um, spike rather we, st we see, and then there's a decline, and then by late 2019, you know, starts that period of uh, BLM two, and uh, you know we get the protests in Minnesota and uh, everywhere else, and I think a lot of people are at home as well. So. 
We're not given an explanation for why that spike is that big, at least. We have some answers for that, but you know, but yeah. And then if we were to then uh, look at, is this the other graph we have to switch to? Yeah. If we were to just kind of isolate the same type of frequency over time and just look at the, the right, uh, right wing sample, then uh, what we'll see is that in the entire period until about George Floyd, uh, we, we, you know, there's this questions of avoidance. They hardly do any kind of, uh, uh, of cartooning on racism in general. It's very low in comparison to the mainstream. And they get up, uh, you know, they start to do a lot more in that period, in the BLM2 period. And mostly when they do things in that point, it's, it's around the movement in, in general. And we'll, and we'll probably talk a little bit about that. So I think one of the things that we want to say here is that rather than misinformation or disinformation to connect to the, to the theme of the, of the conference, of the symposium, the preferred means of dealing with issues of racism for at least a right-wing cartoon is, is, not, is just not to look at it. It's to, to stay away from it, to, to not think much about it. And you know, it's a strategy also I think uh, liberals will do when it comes to like the movement in general or when we isolate on the movement, okay. All right. So we, we wanna switch a little bit and think about like the general work that we've done here. And so, you know, Anisha at the top of the hour mentioned that we've spent some time thinking about frames and uh, we spent a lot of time, you know, thinking about what is the landscape of how we would kind of look at issues around racism, and for us, some major frames came up, issues around the police, frames around that, in the media, we had a big thing on structural racism in America, and movement frames in general, and then solutions. So these are the kind of things that uh, the, the categories in which our larger work uh, em exists, and uh, we won't talk much about those things. What we want to center on, at least for the re remaining time that we have, is on, on police frames and on, on movement in general. So police frames for us, uh, we've broken down into some subframes, which are not stuff that we made up, but these are things that come from the literature. And you know, so we employed a somewhat of a deductive and also somewhat inductive processes of thinking about what, what comes up when we, we look at these things. And so we see things about systemic police violence, things that center on, on the cop themselves as being a bad apple, uh, other things about uh, the something around the, the individual, maybe they caused the police violence, and you know, po quite possibly a more right-wing frame, the use of more force, force, and so on. And so I wanna talk a little bit about the overall patterns of, uh, of framing the police and the significance of of this, so the the movement I uh, we believe is really good at capturing our attention around police. So in the in the period uh, before the Black Lives Matter, so the pre BLM uh, portion of the uh, of of the time series, what we saw is that as a percentage of of, of the mainstream cartooning on things about racism, the police hardly comes up. So they do about 5%, almost 6% there. And B, by the time we get to BLM1, it jumps up significantly to 27. There's this kind of leveling off, or not leveling off, a, a, a big drop. And then it goes right back up again when we get to uh, issues around George Floyd and 2020. And so, you know, so we see that level of cartooning. But what's also most important, I think we want to point out, is the way in which they're depicted in these, sorry, the way in which they're depicted in, in the cartoons themselves. So part of some of the coding processes that we've employed is to think about the valence of, 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 of police figures within cartoons. And we could explain that if, if, if needed later, but overwhelmingly, they're negative, right? We hardly see positive depictions of the police when they're drawn in the mainstream sample. Yeah. And so, and you can see how it, it goes. There's a little bit, almost next to none in the early period, and then a lot of negativity goes down. And this obviously because of the cartooning as well that's going on at that time. So, yeah, so that is essentially what we, what we see when it comes to valence. Uh, yeah. And the final area that we think we, is worth discussing is about the movement itself, right? 
and uh, and what does that mean? So by the movement, we mean we're thinking about just focusing on things connected to BLM and not and nothing else around uh, racism. And so during the pre pre BLM period, there is no cartooning on movements because there there really isn't movements. But that that's not a hundred percent true. There are oftentimes we would get cartoons that cover. Uh, the civil rights movements or other movements, but there's not a, so you wouldn't expect to see there. And then there's this significant, a mild increase during BLM one, but it's not until the BLM two um, period for us that we see this, uh, a significant uh, level of, of, of cartooning about the movement. And during BLM two, I, we, uh, we believe about 40% of the total mainstream cartoons depict the movement, what the depiction, about the movement is, is somewhat contested. If anything, most of the time the movement comes up, it's done so in, <clears throat> in what we believe is a, a negative um, uh, depiction. And uh, you know, during the entire period of Black Lives Matter movement, it's only during the period of Charlottesville riots where positive depictions of the BLM movement actually come up. Outside of that, it's, it's usually negative. And so, while mainstream cartoonists, and for us what mainstream cartoonists are, somewhat hesitant to, to draw the BLM movement itself. So they're cartooning a lot about racism, but they're not doing it about BLM. They're not doing it about the movement specific or the frames that we, we, we figure out and we, we, we think should be coming up. But right-wing cartoonists or conservative cartoonists are the ones who are really uh, cartooning a lot about the movement in BLM too. And as you can see here, it's, it's largely negative, right? You know, there's, you know, and we, you know, we can think, we can talk about that. So one of the things that we think about the movement frame is a lot of different things that depict it from being negative development to a positive influence on society to more neutral frames. And overwhelmingly, when right-wing cartoonists start to, to draw about a movement, it's not in, in a manner that we, that's positive towards it. And so the fact that the liberal cartoonists tend to shy away from this is somewhat a challenge for us. We don't know necessarily why they don't uh, uh, draw about the movement itself. I think Anish has a lot of ideas on this. I want to ask them themselves, but that's a different story. And, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but for their part, right-wing cartoonists, they really attack the movement. And, you know, so there's this, so, if we had to categorize it, the way in which the liberal cartoonists really draw about the police, it's the exact way in which right-wing cartoonists draw about the movement, and then there's this absence with, on, by right-wing for police and absence for liberals on, uh, or mainstream, so left or center probably, on the movement. So that, that's what we, 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 you know, we think is happening. I think, just to wrap up quickly, what we want to say is that when we're working with um, political cartoons, it's especially obvious that we can't really address some of the kind of abuse and things that are inside of the images. You know, these are caricatures, that's precisely what they're meant for. But it offers us an opportunity to think deeper about what kind of structural truths are being told by or pointed out by political cartoons, and what does that mean for the broader vision or landscape of the information that should up at some point be come to our attention and, and maybe information that ought to be true. Uh, I'll just end with a few thoughts about this whole thing of unseeing. Uh, this is a verb that, that I've uh, encountered most uh, imaginatively, imaginatively used by uh, the science fiction writer China Miedo uh, in his book, The City in the City. Um, and in his fictional world, this, this refers to two adjacent cities where the boundaries between them are policed not just through borders, but through a kind of ideological, physiological injunction to unsee people from the other city. A demand literally to not process as sight that which is landing upon one's eyes and recognized as human being if they're from the other side. Something akin to this, I think, is the two-step that we see. On the one hand, the tireless work of movements uh, in bringing attention to issues like racism and brutality uh, uh, is, is ongoing. Uh, and it's a success that is bought, brought about through rare moments of mass mobilizations. And we see that in the police, how, how 
liberal cartoonists are very happy to get on board during the times of the movement. And then, you know, when the movement's not around, the critique of the police disappears altogether as well. Um, so those successes are hard won uh, and, and, and hard fought uh, and seemingly temporary. Uh, equally, however, we see the stubborn return of unseeing, this capacity to return to ignoring the police or questions of racism more generally. Uh, and one of the key reasons for this capacity lies in the fact precisely that liberal mainstream media is unable or unwilling to view a contest over power as part of the process of a freer and more democratic exchange of information. The right, as we showed, has no illusions about the key target. Uh, attacking the movement is critical and undercutting its legitimacy through caricature, distortion, maligning, all of the stuff that you're gonna see here are all part of the toolkit. And attention to the distortions of this information regime would be incomplete without a complementary attention to the fact that they are lodged by the right to prevent the emergence of a more democratic and free information order. For those committed to that freer and more democratic information order, defense of and propagation of the importance of partisanship with just causes, with movements that do this, uh, is just as necessary. Thank you. Okay, we have time for some questions. If folks from the audience have a question, I can bring the mic over so that the people online can hear us. Uh, and also, um, Rachel's gonna uh, see if we have questions online. Yes, Matt. Uh, thanks, both of you. That was really fascinating and uh, super interesting and important. Um, this is maybe a question or maybe a provocation, but I was thinking about when you look at editorial cartoons, you're looking at a particular audience and you're looking at a particular editorial apparatus. And I was kind of thinking about that in relation to something like memes, which are completely untethered from any of that and which sort of operate in their own sort of unhinged information economy. So I was just curious, obviously memes are really difficult to quantify, but have you thought about how memes might be doing work that editorial cartoons just can't do? or maybe disrupting that kind of information economy? Um, I have, this actually, uh, thanks for the question, Matt. Um, it's, an, it's an interesting question, and uh, it comes up regularly, I regularly. I teach a course on political cartoons, and uh, students regularly say, ask this question, are interested to discuss this question of are memes, memes political cartoons or are they not? And of course, the answer is that these are two very different registers that are doing very different things. Um, I think the importance of this register, uh, the fact that somebody is being paid for the effort fewer and fewer, it should be said, uh, there's about 60, so just, just for <laughs> context, there's about 60 steady jobs as political cartoonists across the US right now on a newspaper. So we have about half of that in our sample, right? So this is a pretty significant uh, element. Anyway, the fact that there is that investment is actually, if you like, akin to closer to what is the ruling order and what are the ways in which they are thinking about these set of questions. Uh, I would compare memes more to the kind of study that's been done with tweets. Uh, a lot of the studies around information order and, and BLM tends to be around tweets. Uh, and I think memes, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't looked at it systematically, but my sense is that memes probably enter into, are much more comparable to that. Uh, I think they're doing something different. They're, they're telling us something different about the social structure and so on. Uh, yeah, I, I'll leave it at these are kind of different points within the information order. I would stand up for saying that this is really, really important, precisely because this is the ruling class order and the liberal ruling class order, if you like, uh, that we're, we're having a look at. Um, in the sense of a ruling class order. Like the, the, the political cartoonists that do exist are chatting with their editors. They're, they're, they're very much part of editorial teams. They're thinking very hard about who their audiences are and who's reading these newspapers and, and so on. Um, and so we're getting insight into uh, a certain kind of structure of power in that sense. So yeah. I've so you might have just answered my question, which, <laughs> which was actually uh, back to what, where Dwayne started us off. But um, you know, so out of all the kinds of media you might examine to look at some of these issues, then, uh, and you're, I think you're answering it, but is that why you chose cartoons, or are there other reasons that cartoons were th the things you chose to, to examine? 
some days I don't remember why we cho chose. <laughs> but I think no, I mean they're they're I, the cartoons are elegant in in nature, right? There are you know there's this economy of expression, and uh, unlike the you know there's a lot of work on the editorial pages of newspapers, and we can think about what comes out of that. But when someone really draws something and they have a conversation, they really have to precisely, you know, I I think it really zeroes in on the main frame that they're, they're talking about, what the message is, and if you're good. And I think the people we have are very good. You know, they, we've seen a lot of things that are not good. So I think, <laughs> yeah, and those things are harder to, to think through, right? And so, and depending, and Anish will say more on this, I imagine, but you know, the, the classic opinion on cartoons used to be the best ones are don't have any words, right? And so it really puts you in that space of really, they had to draw it to tell you exactly what the message is. And I think, we think as a medium it's important because it's often overlooked. It's the, what's that book says? It's the stepchild of the, uh, on the editorial page and most places don't have it and we feel it. It's important because it's a way in which that you can distill some of the complex issues that we have and, and I, I think it's important. I don't know if you want to say something. Just a few remarks about what's at stake in, say, studying tweets, which, which is a lot of what happens, uh, and studying something like this. I think these are richer texts, but also more compact. So this is sort of like reading an editorial uh, or coding with an editorial, but not, uh, but, but visual in that sense, right? Uh, as opposed to uh, tweets, which are often very thin in terms of the content that they're putting out. You'd have to look at them collectively to kind of think about depth and richness and kind of what's behind them. Uh, yeah, so just uh, what, what justifies the very considerable effort of kind of hand coding 2,000 cartoons? Uh, that. <laughs> any, uh, any last questions? Yes. Hi, so if um, you were talking about your samples and you've got an X number of cartoons, X, X number of conservative, X number of black cartoonists. In choosing those, it sounded like, but I might be wrong, that you pulled in conservative cartoonists like uh, trying to find conservative ones to bring into it. Did you consider creating your samples by number of eyes, number of readers, and doing it that way down? Because I wonder if in some way by bringing in more if you, were, if you were, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, if you were pulling in more conservative on purpose, if that's like distorting some of the number of, of eyes on it and how much the message gets through. I'm also thinking for like historic purposes, like 10 years from now, somebody looks at the study and like, oh, look at all these conservative cartoonists, but nobody was actually looking at them. And, you, know, you know what I mean? Okay, so, no, I don't think we wanted to just uh, haphazardly just drop in a, a few more cartoonists. Uh, we, we always thought that we wanted this broad landscape, but we, we wanted first, the reason why we thought about mainstream and, and the big prize, because most of those people are syndicated and they're in the major paper, so we think we get a sense of the exact question that you're thinking about, like which eyes are getting on this and how many. But there, it's also a struggle to get all of these. Uh, all, we, we probably could get more conservative cartoons, but they don't necessarily have the, the scope we can't get readily get all the cartoons from. We need it if you're not cartooning throughout the whole period, then we just have to exclude it from that because it, it it does that. The the biggest challenge for us, and maybe libraries can fix this, <laughs> and we I think we came here once before, is that is to get cartoonists that are actually part of the black press, like oh because this was something that we had early on, and I think we may have what two or, and we just can never get the work of that even when we try to pay for it, I don't know, to get, like, it just doesn't exist, at least we haven't seen it. So I think most of our black cartoons are still mainstream, which is, and the black press, at least, we imagine would think about these things much differently, and there are some things that help to develop some of the frames that we think about on issues about race that only the black press puts that out. Like, we, we have a movement frame that is all about tributes to pioneers and no one else draws those unless you're in you know no one goes back and and think about the importance of movements in the past and connects them 
at least from uh, you know in our sample. Let me make make that clear. And yeah, so I think we're missing that kind of stuff. And there's other cartoonists we'd want to have, but we just don't have it. Uh, yeah, and just just to that. Um, the right-wing cartoonists who are in our sample are, are yes, they're very well uh, syndicated as well, and, and so on. They're, they're, they're pretty prominent folk. Yeah, uh, so it's Barvel, not, right? yeah. We, uh, we also have our local Gary Barwell from yeah, we Indianapolis. Uh, Dave Sattler didn't make it, but, uh, okay. Um, the, the, so, so, so uh, this is also why, though, we keep it separate. So we did not select, we did not, we did not want to kind of handpick the cartoonists, we wanted to say, okay, here are these cartoonists who have been honored by each other, right? So that's the, the, the logic of using the prizes. Uh, they happen to kind of fit in with that, but there's also people like Matt Bores who are not necessarily kind of mass circulation uh, folks, but folks who are kind of uh, honored by, by each other in that sense within the cartooning community, which is, as I mentioned, increasingly small and so on. Um, so, so yeah, so, so that in terms of the sample and in terms of how it's getting out there uh, and what the balance of getting out there versus who people think are really skilled practitioners versus a whole bunch of other things. Um, that we, we thought the, the, the prize thing was, was a good version of that. I will push back against the idea that no one is seeing right-wing cartoonists. Have you ever run a Google search for political cartoons? Yeah. All Google throw at you is right-wing cartoonists, one after the other. Uh, it's pretty impressive, uh, kind of what just a general search uh, throws out. Uh, pretty obscure right-wing cartoonists who aren't on any uh, major newspaper or syndication, etc. Their their stuff gets out, and that's the algorithm thing, and and so on. Who's getting what angry, and to what extent, and that sort of thing. So. Um, the eyeballs thing, I'm not worried about. <laughs> like the right wingers are getting huge numbers of eyeballs. So that's 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 not a. So uh, we have one more question from online. Um, people online want to learn more. Is this research published? No <laughs> <laughs> um, Yes, yes, we, 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 have, uh, we have an article in a textbook, uh, as well as a, an article in Politics, Groups, and Identities, uh, uh, based on this work. Um, for the last three summers, I've been saying that this summer we're going to sit down and uh, write the book. This summer we're going to sit down and write the book. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, uh, that's, that, that's the short answer. Okay, well let's give a, a big hand again to Anish and Dwayne. <laughs>